branches of government. Um, today, we're going to talk about what are the factors that goes into a judge's decision. When a judge or a justice of the federal courts decide on a case, what are the things that influences his decision? Now, the number one thing that should influence his decision is the Constitution of the United States. The problem with the Constitution of the United States is it's open for interpretation. For those of you that have AP English right now, when you guys read an essay or when you read a book, when you read a novel, and they ask you to interpret the, what, what the book is about, you're going to have different interpretations. And that's why there's disagreements in the courts. Whenever the Supreme Court makes a decision, it's not like all nine justices agree all the time. Why? Because our founding fathers did not leave us a very detailed constitution. They left us a constitution that's open for interpretation. That's why when a judge makes a decision, his ideology and his political party affects how he decides. So what is an ideology? His ideology is his beliefs and values about government. His beliefs and values about government. His party affiliation is the party that he identifies with. When a judge makes a decision, his beliefs and values come into play. Because again, the Constitution is open for interpretation. Liberal justices, they tend to interpret the Constitution liberally. Conservative justices tend to um, um, interpret the Constitution very conservatively. So when we have a Supreme Court that's filled with conservatives, they usually make conservative decisions. And when we have a Supreme Court that's filled with liberals, they usually make liberal decisions. So their ideology and their political parties affect how they decide. So right now, this is the composition of our Supreme Court, nine justices in a Supreme Court. And as you can see, most of them are conservative, appointed by Republican presidents like um, like um, George W. Bush and President Trump. But we also have liberal justices appointed by Democrat, Democratic presidents like Donald Trump, I'm sorry, like Obama and um, Clinton. But as you can see, the liberals are, are outnumbered right now. There are five conservatives to four liberal justices, which means our court right now will probably make conservative decisions when they're deciding on a case. The problem that liberals have today is one of their liberal justices, Justice Ginsburg right here, has passed away. And a conservative president is the one that's supposed to choose her replacement. If he's able to do so and gets that person confirmed, I think he appointed a woman as a replacement, then that advantage that conservatives have will be even greater, a six to three advantage. So when they're voting on how they decide on a case, the conservatives will always have an advantage. The composition of the court is always ever-changing because there's justices that die and there's justices that retire. Sometimes the courts lean conservative, sometimes the court lean liberal. And right now we have a very conservative court and it's probably going to get more conservative once Donald Trump gets his um, appointment confirmed by the Senate. All right, this affects the confirmation process because if, if the Senate is controlled by Republicans, they tend to resist um, democratic or liberal judges, but if it's the same party, if it's the same ideology, that appointment process is going to be a lot easier. So right now, um, that woman that Donald Trump appointed, it's probably going to be very easy for her to get confirmed because the Senate is controlled by Republicans who are also conservative, and she's a conservative, so the Senate would like her, so the confirmation process will go smoother. But if she's a liberal, that confirmation process will be a lot harder. All right, let's move on. So those of you who are liberals in this class, which I'm assuming most of you are because young people tend to be more liberal, the Supreme Court is not on your side. Those of you who are conservative, the good news for you is the court is probably going to be conservative for a very long time. It's probably gonna be conservative for like 20 or 30 more years. All right, another factor that comes into play when a judge or a justice makes a decision besides his own ideology besides his own beliefs is cases from the past you need to know this word presidents it's pronounced like president of the united states but it's it's spelled differently with a ce so if you need a definition presidents are examples or guidelines established by a previous court case examples or guidelines established by a previous court case whenever the courts make a decision they're not only making that decision for that, for that particular case, for that immediate scenario. They're making that decision for similar cases in the future. That's why we talk about cases in this class, not because of their impact in that immediate time, but because they impact 
future court cases. They impact future courts. So for example, every court case, like I told you, establishes a guideline. It establishes a rule that's going to be looked at by future courts, but in future cases that are similar to that case. So we've talked about a lot of cases in this class, like Baker versus Carr and Shaw versus Reno. What rule or what president was established in Baker versus Carr? That when you're doing redistricting, those districts better be what? What was the in size? Population similar size? size? Population size. Very good. They should have approximately similar population sizes. One person, one vote. If a similar case comes to the court in the future that is similar to Baker versus Carr, what the judges are going to do is they're going to look back at that case. They're going to look at the decision that the courts make, and they're going to use that as a guide when they're making that decision because it's a similar case. If the Supreme Court today gets a case about abortion, which court case would they look at? What's the most famous court case about regarding abortion? U.S. history, guys. What's the most famous court case regarding abortion? It's called Roe versus Wade. So they're going to look at that case and the president established by that case. What was established in Shaw versus Reno? That when you're drawing these lines, what shouldn't be the main factor? Race. Race should not be the main factor. And if they get a case like that in the future that's very similar, then they're going to look at that president and they're going to use it as a guide when they're making decisions. They don't have to, but usually that's what they do. They look at previous court cases and they use that as a guide. Again, they don't have to, but they usually do. In, in Marbury versus Madison, the courts can do judicial review. In McCulloch versus Maryland, federal government is supreme over the state governments and the federal government has implied powers. The, that's why we talk about these cases. Not for their impact in that just that one scenario and their immediate impact on that case, we talk about these cases because all of them establish precedents that future cases will use as a guide when they're making decisions. Now, you need to remember this word, stare decisis. In Latin, stare decisis means let the decision stand. So here's what this means, guys. I'm going to make it very basic for you. President means a rule or a guideline established by a court case. When a court uses a president to decide on a similar case, they are practicing stare decisis. So those rules or guidelines established by a case, we call those presidents. When the court uses a president, they're practicing stare decisis. Stare decisis is the act of using a president from a previous court case and applying them to a similar case. Does everybody get the difference between the two? Presidents are rules or guidelines established by a previous case. If a court uses a president as a guide or applies a president in a similar case, they are practicing stare decisis. It's the idea that our courts today are bound by decisions that have been made in the past. That's why we study court cases in the class. Those of you that are going to be on lawyers, you're going to be studying court cases all the time because you're going to be using past cases to support your argument. So if you're a lawyer, you're going to be arguing, you know what, that previous case, this is how they decided. That's why you should decide the same way. You should be using precedents. All right. Now, any court can establish a president. We talked about how in the federal court system, there's a hierarchy of courts, the lowest court in the United States are the district trial courts, followed by the appellate courts, and the highest court of the land is the Supreme Court. If a district court establishes a president, that president can be overturned by a higher court. So it can be overturned in the appellate courts. Those presidents made by the appellate courts can also be overturned by the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is so powerful that not only can they overturn decisions and presidents coming from lower federal courts, they can also overturn decisions and presidents coming from state courts as well. They're the final say in what is constitutional and unconstitutional. So not only can they overturn presidents established by lower federal courts, they can also overturn decisions made by state courts as well, which begs the question, if a Supreme Court establishes a president, 
who can overturn that president? Or is that president permanent? Give you an example. 1892, there was a Supreme Court case called Plessy versus Ferguson. In Plessy versus Ferguson, those of you that remember from U.S. history, the Supreme Court established the president of separate but equal, which means state governments are allowed to segregate people according to race as long as they provide them with equal accommodations. There can be a white drinking fountain and a black drinking fountain as long as those drinking fountains are the same. You can separate students to black schools and white schools as long as the books are the same, as long as the quality of education are the same. They establish separate but equal. Do we have segregation today? No, we don't. We don't have segregation. We don't separate people according to race anymore. The government cannot do that anymore. So somewhere between 1892 and today, that president was overturned. But that was a Supreme Court president. Who overturned that decision? Who overturned that president? Who can do that? Who can overturn Supreme Court presidents? I'll give you a hint. It's not Congress. They can't do that. They can't overturn Supreme Court decisions. It's not the president. They can't do that also. Go ahead, Valerie. No, never mind. OK. It's not the other branches. They have no power over that. They have no power over a decision made by the courts. They can only choose not to enforce it and stuff like that, but the Supreme Court's word is usually final. But who overturns Supreme Court presidents? Those rules established by the Supreme Court can be overturned by someone. The question is who? By itself. Very good, whoever said that. They can be overturned by the Supreme Court itself. So here's what happened with Plessy versus Ferguson. So when Plessy was handed down, they established this president of separate but equal. 50 years later, we have a court case called Brown versus Board of Education the Supreme Court also decided on, and Brown versus Board of Education overturned the president established by Plessy versus Ferguson. Here's my question. Did the justices change their mind? Between Plessy and Brown, did they realize, oh, we did it, this is wrong? What happened? What allowed that to happen? What allowed the Supreme Court to change? Did those justices wake up one day and suddenly say, oh, we shouldn't be racist anymore? Go ahead, Rebecca, I'm sorry. New justices got uh, appointed? Very good. These justices are not immortal. They'll die. Well, they'll retire. And new ones will get appointed by new presidents. So the membership of the Supreme Court will always change. So there might be presidents right now that in the future are going to be overturned because the composition of the Supreme Court is going to change. So right now we have a very conservative Supreme Court. And those presidents that are liberal in the past, like, Abortion is going to be legal and gay marriage is going to be legal. Like I told you before, those are in danger today. Those presidents can be overturned by this conservative Supreme Court. So suddenly, gay marriage might be illegal again or abortion might be restricted again in the United States. Because no president is safe as long as the membership of the Supreme Court is always fluctuating between liberal to conservative and conservative to liberal those presidents will always be in danger of being overturned and new ones will always get created. Does that make sense for everybody? The composition or the membership of the Supreme Court is always changing. New just judges and justices are being appointed to the Supreme Court. So sometimes it's going to be liberal and sometimes it's going to be more conservative, which means presidents are always in danger of being overturned and new ones are always going to be created. The things that we take for granted today, they might be overturned tomorrow. So to answer this question over here, there's a constant shifting of what is the dominant ideology of the Supreme Court. Right now it's conservatism, but maybe 20 years from now it's going to be more liberal. And those presidents they established right now, those conservative presidents that are going to be established in the next five years, those might get overturned in the next 10 years. 
because new judges and justices are being added to the Supreme Court and old ones are dying off or retiring. Is anyone confused by that? So this is on your, this is on your test later on. It's going to ask you, why are presidents constantly being overturned or why are new ones changing? It's because the composition of the courts are always changing. It's always shifting. The dominant ideology could be liberal one day, it could be the conservative the next day. It just depends on who gets appointed to the courts. Does that make sense for everyone? Anyone confused by that? So again, some of these justices, they consider cases in the past, they consider presidents in the past when they're making decisions, but they don't have to. Sometimes they break those presidents, they overturn those presidents, and they create new ones. But most of the time, they do like to follow presidents because it gives their decision more of a credibility. This is how they voted, this is how they decided in the past, so this is how we're going to decide today. That's called stare decisis. Make sure you remember that. All right, so this is our main topic for today, and I need you to listen carefully today because some people get lost when I talk about judicial philosophy. So another thing that affects a judge's decision is what he thinks his role is in American society. Does he believe that the courts have the right to change the United States for the better? Or does he believe the courts are not there to change the United States, but are just there to answer questions about the Constitution? Does he believe that a judge has a limited role? Or does he believe a judge has the capability to make the United States better? So that's, there's two competing philosophies when it comes to that. And that's something that you guys need to struggle with. What kind of judge do you want in the courts? Do you want somebody who's more active or do you want somebody who's more restrained? This is something that all of us that are adults that know this stuff, we have to struggle with this. All right, so let's talk about how these two ideologies differ. What you need to remember is every decision the, the government, the Supreme Court makes, is like a policy. It's a powerful policy. It's not a law. It's not like Congress creating a law, but their decision still carries weight. It carries the force of law. When in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court decided that abortion is going to be legal everywhere in the United States, that's them making policy. It's not them making legislation, but it's still policy. It's like a law. Their decisions carry the weight of a law. Now, whether or not you think that the court should be able to do that or not be able to do that, that's what judicial philosophy means. So let's take a look at two of the most dominant ones, judicial activism and judicial restraint. In judicial activism, a judge has a agenda. He has something that he wants to accomplish. He has a goal that he, that he thinks would make the country better. And if you're a judicial activist, as a judge, you're not going to be afraid to use your power as a judge of the courts to be able to achieve that goal, to be able to achieve that change that you want, that you desire. So judicial activists are judges or justices that have certain goals, that have certain agendas. And what makes them different is they're not afraid to use their power as a judge of the federal court to be able to achieve that agenda, to be able to achieve that goal, that change that they desire, that they think is going to make the country better. They're not afraid to use their power. Next, they actively create policy with their decisions. They're not afraid to make policy. They're not afraid to change the United States. What's that one weapon that this, the courts have that we talked about with Marbury versus Madison? What's that one weapon that they have? What's that one power that's so important that the courts have according to Marbury versus Madison? They have what? Judicial review. Judicial review, the ability to determine whether or not something is constitutional or unconstitutional. That's a powerful sword. If you believe in judicial activism, a judge does not, is not afraid to wield that sword and swing it around. He's not going to be afraid to strike down laws and legislation and action that he thinks are unconstitutional, especially if it's going to make a better country, especially if it's going to make a better society. 
especially if it's going to allow him to achieve that agenda that we talked about. So somebody that believes in judicial activism is not afraid to boldly strike down laws in order to achieve a goal, in order to achieve an agenda. Those justices in Roe versus Wade that declared all those state laws that illegalize abortion unconstitutional, this is what they did. They had an agenda. The agenda is to legalize abortion in the United States. And in order to achieve that agenda, they used judicial review on those state laws that banned abortion. And they weren't afraid to do so because they believe that's what's going to be good for the United States. They had a goal in mind and they weren't afraid to use their power of judicial review to strike down those state laws that are anti-abortion to achieve that goal. And that is to protect the bodily rights of a woman. That's judicial activism. Next, they're not afraid to create new presidents. They're not afraid to create new presidents and overturn old ones. They're not afraid to create new presidents and overturn old ones. If you believe in judicial activism, you are not always bound by what they decided in the past. If you think what the Supreme Court did in the past was wrong, you're not scared to overturn those presidents. You're not just blindly following what the courts of the past have done or have decided especially if you believe that they're wrong for the country. You're not afraid to overturn those presidents and create new ones. Most of the time, you're still going to follow old presidents. But if you really believe that they're bad for the country, you're not going to be afraid to say, you know what, we're not going to decide that way in this case. We're not going to follow stare decisis in this case. We're not going to just blindly follow presidents. Next. Judicial activists are not afraid to promote change. That's the main difference, guys. People that believe in judicial activism, they believe that judges should be able to change the country for the better. Should not be afraid to make decisions that are, that are going to change the United States for the better. Or what they think is the better. Finally, a lot of people feel like that when a judge interprets the constitution when he looks at the constitution he must be limited by the words that it says he shouldn't try to infer things that are not really in the constitution of the united states he should be very superficial in his interpretation of constitution whatever the constitution says that's it don't try to make up things don't try to infer things that are, aren't really there be strict in your interpretation of the constitution Judicial activists are not that way. They interpret the Constitution very loosely. They infer things about the Constitution that is not explicitly in the Constitution of the United States. And what they do is they apply modern day values and sensibilities when they're interpreting the Constitution. They apply modern day values and sensibilities. They, apply, they interpret the Constitution very loosely. Do not put this on your essays, guys. It's not that they don't follow the Constitution. It's not that they, don't, they make decisions not based on the Constitution. They still make their decisions based on the Constitution, but they interpret the Constitution in a very loose manner. It's, they're just not limited to the superficial things that are in the Constitution, the text of the Constitution. All right, let's take a look at the opposite philosophy, judicial restraint. Here's what judicial restraint people believe in. You shouldn't have an agenda as a judge. You shouldn't have a goal. You have one job, and that job is to answer questions about the Constitution. So you shouldn't have an end goal in mind. You shouldn't be using your powers to be able to achieve your own personal goals about how the country should be and what the country should look like in the future. Sure, maybe you agree that abortion should be legal, but you shouldn't be using your power to achieve that agenda. Your job is to say, yep, that's constitutional. Nope, that's not constitutional. That's your job. You have a very limited one. Your job is not to make changes. Your job is not to achieve an agenda. Your job is to answer questions about the Constitution. You have a very limited role. That's why it's called restraint. They believe that 
Govern the Supreme Court should not be making sweeping policy changes. They shouldn't be making powerful decisions that's going to make a lot of changes in the United States. Leave policy making to those who are elected. Leave policy making to those who are elected. Leave policy making to the other two branches of government, to Congress especially and the President of the United States. Leave policy making to the state governments. Your job is not to create policy. Your job is to answer questions about the Constitution. You shouldn't be using your power given to you to achieve goals, to achieve an agenda. That's not your job. Next, be cautious of your use of judicial review. Be cautious of your use of judicial review. What that means is don't be striking down laws and legislation willy-nilly or for the sake of achieving a goal, like what they did in Roe versus Wade. Do not use your power of judicial review willy-nilly. Uh, willy use it sparingly. Only in cases where something is obviously unconstitutional, then that's fine. That's when you can use judicial review. But you just shouldn't be striking down laws because you disagree with those laws. You have to really make sure that they're unconstitutional. Here's why. And I want you to really um, pay attention here because this is the main argument of people that believe in judicial restraint and why judges should not be just uh, swinging that sword willy-nilly, should keep that sword in their scabbard. The reason is Congress, senators and House of Representative members and people that work in the state legislatures, the difference between them and the judges of the court is that they're elected. These laws were made by people who are actually elected by the American people. And a lot of people argue, what gives these judges and justices, these unelected judges and justices the right to strike down laws that were created by people who are actually elected? That's why when you're wielding judicial review, you have to be careful. You have to use it sparingly because you have to keep in mind these laws were created by people who, unlike you, are actually chosen by the American public, by the American people. That's one of the main arguments of people that believe in judicial restraint. If you believe in judicial activism, you believe that argument is BS because the whole idea of the Supreme Court and the federal courts is to protect them from public pressures. So they should be allowed to strike down laws whenever they want without worrying about what the people think. All right, so next, again, be cautious of your use of judicial review. Use it sparingly, only in cases where something is obviously unconstitutional. Don't use it to achieve a goal that you have. Remember, you're not elected. These people that created these laws, they're the ones that were elected. Next, limit yourself to a referee role. Limit themselves to a referee role. What people that believe in judicial restraint believe in is that Judges and justices are not supposed to be players. They're not the ones that's supposed to be making policy. That's the job of Congress. That's the job of the state legislatures. That's the job of the president. That's not the court's job. Their job is to be the referees of the Constitution, to answer questions about what the Constitution says. You should limit yourself to that role. You shouldn't be trying to make policy and change the United States because that's not your job. Anyone have any questions so far? Next. Again, the main difference between the two guys is one is not afraid to make changes using their power and the other is. So if you're afraid to change the United States, what do you feel about presidents? Are presidents to be followed or are presidents to be broken? If you're afraid to make changes. Followed? The presidents are to be followed. So people that believe in judicial restraint, they believe that judges and justices should always look at presidents and should always follow presidents and avoid overturning presidents and creating new ones because that's going to change the United States and people that believe in judicial restraint doesn't believe that courts should be able to do that. So instead of creating new presidents or overturning old ones, follow presidents. So you're, when you're making decisions, you should be bound by what the courts have decided in the past. And finally, 
when it comes to the interpretation of the Constitution of the United States, unlike people that believe in judicial activism, people that believe in judicial restraint, they interpret the Constitution very strictly. It's called strict constructionism, very strictly. They don't try to assume things about the Constitution. They don't try to conclude things that are implied by the Constitution. They go by what the Constitution says and nothing more. They're very strict in their interpretation, very literal in their interpretation. People that believe in judicial activism, they've kind of like skew the Constitution. They interpret it very loosely to favor their agenda. People that believe in judicial restraint, that's it. Whatever the Constitution says goes. You shouldn't add anything to it. You shouldn't try to conclude things about the Constitution. Strict interpretation. And finally, you need to remember this word right here, original intent. When a, some, when a judge that believes in judicial restraint is interpreting the Constitution, he considers what the original intent of our founding fathers were. He doesn't use modern day values and apply them to the Constitution. What he does is, what did Hamilton, Madison, and those 55 people that wrote the Constitution mean by what, what the words that they wrote in the Constitution? They consider the original intent of the framers of the Constitution or the, of the people that wrote the Constitution. And they limit themselves to that. It doesn't matter what I believe right now. It doesn't matter what society believes in right now. What matters in my interpretation of the Constitution is what the founding fathers believed. And you can see that in the, in the fellows' papers. You can see their original intent uh, by reading the fellows' papers. So again, you limit yourself. You limit yourself to the text of the Constitution and you limit yourself to the interpretation of our founding fathers. Don't try to add anything. Don't try to use modern day values and sensitive sensibilities when you're interpreting the Constitution. The argument to that is if you're somebody that believes in judicial activism, a lot of our founding fathers, actually all of them, did not think women should vote. Some of those people that wrote the Constitution had slaves. Why should we always listen to them when we're interpreting the Constitution? Because obviously they got a lot of things wrong. They let slavery continue. They did not, they made women second class citizens in the United States. So they believe a judge should be free to apply his own values, modern day values, into his interpretation of the Constitution and not be limited to what those old guys 200 years ago felt what the Constitution says. And again, guys, as you're growing up, this is your struggle. What kind of judge do you want? You want a judge that has a very limited role, that feels like he's restricted, that has one job and that's it? Or do you want a judge that's going to be able to change the United States? And keep in mind, some of those changes you may not like. All right. So let's talk about examples in history. In the 1950s to the 1970s, and for two decades, the Warren Court of the Burger, oh, by the way, Supreme Courts are named after their Chief Justice. So right now, our Chief Justice, there's nine Supreme Court, one of, I'm sorry, there's nine Supreme Court Justices, and one of them is the Chief Justice. Our Chief Justice today is Justice John Roberts, this guy right here, he's the Chief Justice. So our Supreme Court today is called the Roberts Court. It's named after whoever's the Chief Justice at that period of time. When he retires or dies and a new chief justice um, gets in, then we're going to call that court something different. So during the 1950s and the 1970s, we called the courts the Warren Court and the Burger Court. They were very activists. I'm going to write that down, please. They were very activists. These courts were not afraid to make decisions that were going to change the United States. They weren't afraid to overturn laws, to overturn state laws and federal laws to achieve goals. These are the courts that ended segregation in public schools in Brown versus Board of Education when Congress wouldn't listen to African Americans. These are the courts that ended segregation. These are the courts that legalize abortion in Roe versus Wade. If you all know Miranda rights, you have the right to remain silent and stuff like that. That's the court that made that decision that police are supposed to warn you about those rights. This was a very active court. Again, they weren't afraid to make changes. They had an agenda and they used their power as judges and justices in order to achieve that agenda. However, after the Burger Court, 
it was replaced by the Rehnquist Court, and the Rehnquist Court was more restrained. A lot of those justices, they believe in judicial restraint, that the country should not be making sweeping changes, and we should allow Congress and the state governments to be able to make laws without us striking them down all the time with judicial review. So during the Rehnquist Court, which is in the 80s and the early 90s, they didn't use judicial review all that much. They used it sparingly. They didn't strike down laws and state laws all the time. They didn't make sweeping changes with their decisions. They followed presidents in the past. All right. Just to hammer this home, guys, I need you to know the difference between the two. So when it comes to policy agenda, who believes that a judge should be able to use his power to achieve an agenda, to achieve a goal? Judicial activists or people that believe in judicial restraint? Activists. People that believe in activism. If you have a goal as a judge that you think is going to make the United States better, you're not, you shouldn't be afraid to use your power to be able to achieve that goal. People that believe in judicial restraint believe judges and justices are not supposed to have agendas in the first place. They're supposed to be there for one purpose only, and that is to answer questions about the Constitution and serve the Constitution of the United States, that document. Everyone good so far? What do people believe, what do people that believe in judicial restraint believe about presidents? That they should be what? Followed. Followed. That they should be strictly followed. That the courts should refrain from overturning presidents or creating new ones. Follow presidents. Follow old presidents. Try to be, try to limit yourselves from creating new ones or overturning old ones. While if you believe in judicial activism, you're not afraid to overturn presidents that you think are unjust, like what they did with Plessy versus Ferguson's president. Next, judicial review. Who believes that judicial review should uh, be used sparingly or limitedly? Which philosophy believes that? Judicial activism or judicial restraint? Restraint. Restraint. Judicial restraint. Use judicial review. Use that power very sparingly, only in cases where something is obviously con unconstitutional. Because remember, the people that made them are elected. Unlike you, you're not elected. People that believe in judicial activism believe, you know what, screw that. There's a reason why the courts are undemocratic. It's because we should be able to make decisions. We should be able to strike down laws that we feel are unjust without worrying about what the people think, without worrying about what anybody else think. That's why our founding fathers made an independent judiciary in the first place. Next. What's the role of the court? If you believe in judicial restraint, you're just a referee. That's your role. If you believe in judicial activism, you believe that the courts can change the United States for the better, can actively change the United States, actively make policy to make this country better. Whether or not it's going to be better or not, that's up to you. But it's a double-edged sword. All right, interpretation. This is loose interpretation for judicial activism. You assume things. You're just not, you're not limited to the surface of what the Constitution says strictly, to the written Constitution strictly. You interpret it very loosely. It's not that you don't follow the Constitution. It's, it's just that your interpretation of the Constitution is very loose. You assume things about the Constitution. If you believe in judicial restraint, you're very strict in your interpretation. You're a strict constructionist. So just what the Constitution says, that's it. Don't add anything to it. Don't assume anything about the Constitution. People that believe in judicial restraint also believe in original intent, which means you consider what our founding fathers believed. If you believe in activism, you're okay with applying modern day values to how you interpret the Constitution. Anyone have any questions over those? Make sure you remember that. All right, here's what you need to know today, guys. Today, oftentimes, the Supreme Court makes very controversial decisions. What you need to remember today is the word judicial activist is used today as a negative. When a judge is accused of being an activist, he is not being complimented. 
It's a pejorative term today. What it means today is that you are overstepping your boundaries. You are overreaching. You are abusing power. That's what people refer to when they say you are a judicial activist. You are playing a role you're not supposed to play. So today, the word judicial activist is not a good term. It's not a good compliment. So whenever there's a controversial decision that, that the court makes, there's accusations of judicial activism, that the court is playing a role they're not supposed to play. But here's what the thing, and this is the funny thing about the United States, judicial activism is in the eye of the beholder. So what usually happens is when the court makes a liberal decisions, the conservatives get angry and they accuse the court of being activists. But when the court makes a conservative decision, it's the liberals that accuse the court of being activists. It's just that they don't agree with the decision. That's it. If you don't agree with the decision, people tend to accuse the courts of being activists. That's usually what happens in the United States. If you agree with the decision, why does it matter? You're not going to accuse the courts of anything even if they are overstepping their boundaries. All right, so there's often questions about the legitimacy of the courts, whether or not they have the right to make such important decisions in the first place, especially when they break president, especially if they overturn laws made by people who are elected. There's questions about whether or not the courts have the power to do so in the first place. And that usually leads to problems like their decision not being enforced because remember, the biggest weakness of the courts is that they're not able to enforce their own decisions. They have to rely on the other branches. They have to rely on state governments to enforce their own decisions. However, when they make such an important decision and people question whether or not they have the right to make that decision in the first place, that can give presidents, Congress, or the state governments an excuse not to enforce the decision. So courts have to be very careful. They have to toe this line because if they do make a very powerful decision that's controversial. People can question whether or not they can legitimately make such an important decision, even though they're not elected. And that can lead to that decision not being enforced properly or not being enforced at all. So they have to be careful. All right, we don't have a lot of time. I'll show you a video very quickly. Again, you have one assignment tonight. One of them is uh, bonus. Those of you that need it, please do it they know for places they don't maybe a better question is what are you waiting for all right this video uh, happened five years ago 